Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 14, Future Proofing Next's webcast, The Great Debate, Data versus Creative, Which One Will Win? And today, I'd like to start with the introduction, which is, which is going to be the better driver of business innovation, smarter data team or the intuitive creative team? And we have today with us, first, my co-host, Sean Moffitt, and I'm Andrea Cates, and we are from Future Proofing Next. I feel like I should be clapping here like Family Feud or something. This feels, uh, you know, this is edutainment, I think, but uh, yeah, I feel rather competitive today, so. Well, I'll tell you what the rules are. First of all, yes, we do have a bell. And that will start the beginning of every round. And yes, this is a cappuccino bell, but it is the bell that we have. Second, um, we are hoping that everybody who is, uh, who is viewing this is, I hope you understand that you are a judge. So we don't have judges internally because Sean and I, I don't know if you can tell this, but we're really competitive. So team data, that's my team who, by the way, my just win? I mean, well, we don't know. But we're going to be literally competing against Sean. So today's polls, when you take the polls, are not just polls. They are actually going to be deciding the points of who wins this debate today. So let the games begin. So Sean, uh, do you want to show the next slide of, of how we begin the themes and start to introduce them? Or you want to just start uh, fist, fists up? Well, I thought maybe we we should introduce our teams first, just so we don't have six other faces maybe lurking in the in the clouds here. I'll I'll introduce my folks if you want to introduce yours. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, go for it. Um, I was reading through all their bios, even though I know uh, all of them personally, and they're just thick, thick, thick of great credentials and and winning credentials here too. So I'm I'm very positive our team's going to end up on the the winning side here. Um, in no particular order, Anthea Foyer. Um, she is a creative and strategy leader. She's worked in arts and culture and entertainment and digital and, and various government realms. She's a project lead for smart cities in Mississauga, which you can correct me on this, but if you took Mississauga as a city in Canada, I think it could be like the fourth or big, fifth biggest city in Canada. She's um, spent a ton of time on different boards. Um, she, I love her motto. She loves it when be uh, beautiful thing ha things happen when worlds collide. And she is also an artist as well. So she has um, not only chops in terms of you know, creating some sense out of it. Um, she's also an artist and storyteller in her regular day and night life. Rob Salkowitz is a good friend of mine. Uh, he is based out of Seattle, Washington. He contributes to Forbes, but uh, that's probably being disingenuous to his accomplishments. He's an author, he's an educator, he's a consultant, he's a specialist in how social, how uh, social and brand and business impact in digital media. He is also a very um, deep, deep expert in comics. He's written six books, and two of them are The Business of Pop Culture and Comic Con. Um, and he also contributes regularly to Forbes in terms of entertainment and media. And then finally, Samantha Yarwood. She is the Chief Innovation and Inspiration Officer for Shift Toronto. She's uh, been in various Fortune 500 companies, applying her trade in strategy and innovation and marketing. And she is currently, I've, I've managed to extract her out of her Masters of Change. So she's in the last rows of finishing her Masters of Change up. So I appreciate the time and uh, go Team Creative. Woohoo! Okay, so we are now on to Team Data and I'll introduce in order first Daryl Drennan. This is the order that they'll be uh, in the ring, by the way. Uh, uh, Daryl Drennan is an expert both in telecom and technology and knows how to bring double digit growth to incredible teams of people and he makes them even more incredible. One of the things that I love, he's with Center Technologies right now and one of the things that I have always loved about Daryl is that he sees, un he understands the depths of data and can see patterns in the data before other people. And I think you'll see that in full force today and it's great to see you again from Houston, Texas. Fantastic, yay, Daryl. So ne <laughs> next we have Tom Jays, and Tom and I met recently. He's a member of something that we call the Gray Swan Guild, which is a group of global leaders who are sense makers and curious. And we gather people from around the world to figure out what in the heck is going on. It's how we met Tom, and it turns out he is also a, quite the data maven. 
Right now, he's the acting head of strategy and innovation at DG Link, it, the European Parliament. So he joins us today from Brussels, Belgium. And one of the things that we learned recently is that, Tom, you might have to hold up fingers. How many languages do you speak fluently? Six fluently, and one of them is English, and we'll be doing that today. And he's half Portuguese as well. So uh, we have lots of ways that if there are extra points given for a British accent and for foreign language ability, we'll be able to translate and, and be quite fluid in that. And has, uh, Tom has a lot of depth in terms of very under, a good understanding of data models and how they apply to decision making, both in government as well as in business. So welcome, Tom. And finally, uh, the person that's going to bring it all home for Team Data is Dina Sharif. And we met a few years ago in San Francisco, yay, Dina, when uh, she was assigned to me or I was assigned to her to, to have a, a close relationship between the innovation that was going on in Egypt and what was happening in Silicon Valley. So we met there and have been good colleagues ever since. One of the things that was impressive about me at the time is she co-founded a group called Ahead of the Curve in 2012 to forward a goal of more conscious forms of capitalism. And she has been a global leader. I met her when she was a fellow for the Eisenhower Fellow. Um, and that's why she spent a year, almost like a, a traveling fellowship to understand different innovation groups around the world. And she is now the acting, let's see, uh, the executive director at Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship at MIT. And she continues to be the founding partner of Ahead of the Curve. So welcome from Cairo, Egypt, Dina. Woo! So that's our team. <laughs> and uh, we were just joking. We, uh, we are really excited about this because we know that there's complexity. And what's really important in these confusing times is how do you make decisions? How do you really figure out what's the best approach? There's so much kind of um, airtime given to you have to make decisions based on your gut. You have to make decisions based on creativity. You have to make decisions based on new insights. At the same time, we are living in a world of so much data that we can't help but be overwhelmed from time to time. And how do we make sense of this? And which is the better approach in terms of business innovation? So Sean, any thoughts before we see the next slide? Yeah, I know we, uh, we actually did do some research on this last year. We actually used a research tool where you can have the sliding bar of where you are versus where you, something else uh, across two different polls. And we asked this very specific question, which we thought coming into this year may, led to a very interesting debate. So I will give the data team an allowance that we may have a slight skew. And I mean, extraordinarily slight skew in the population that says, yes, the best innovation comes from, you know, we are not quite at 50, generally a little bit more than uh, over the uh, the equator there in terms of just um, people siding toward intuition. But this is a pretty even Stephen debate. So uh, my hope is as we see poll results coming in, they're uh, the reflection of our arguments maybe. Great, and I had some slides up front. I'm not sure if we're gonna show them. Um, uh, that was the introductory slides for the topic. This one? Uh, I don't know, it has a canary on it. There we go. Are you seeing this one? I am not seeing it yet. Oh, are you there, Andrea? Yeah, I'm here, but I don't see the slide. But I'll talk to it, and, and we'll just let you get the slide when it comes out. Um, so the first thing is, um, I wanted to set the stage with a couple of things before we go into the first round. And the first thing that I, I wanted to set the stage, because I also want to let Sean set the stage with regards to creativity. One of the things that um, that that we wanted to talk about in terms of data, because data sometimes gets a bad name because it's just so full of data. You know, how do you make sense of all of this? So one of the things we, we like to talk about is canaries, you know, canaries in the coal mine, how you can use data, which is, this is a must. You can't just stare at data and say, oh, you gave us data that says 52% of your audience is women and, and end up with your insight, which is, oh, you know what? Here's our insight, 52% of your audience is women. So that's not having an insight, that's just responding, you know, repeating data in a different pattern. And that's one of the traps that people fall into sometimes with data is that they just see the data, <laughs> they can't come to an insight. So the next part that we'll be establishing through our thinking is the notion of anomalies. And that's where, wait a minute, our customer satisfaction scores have been four out of five, four out of five, four out of five in this category for five years. 
and suddenly they're five out of five. Are we doing something differently that we're getting better scores? Or maybe our sales are going, you know, pretty flat, pretty flat, pretty flat, but our competitive advantage has gone down somehow. And so our ability to look at competition and see whether we have share of market has gone down. So the, the market might be growing, but here's something weird. We're not owning as much of a share of it. So it's the ability to see those nuances that sometimes is the key to, to people who are good at translating data into business innovation. The third thing that we're really excited about is this notion of emergence. And that's where you see what they used to call a long tail. There was a book that was written about the long tail where you see it, it started off in the music industry, right? There used to be hits. And I think that boys, to men, I'm trying to think there was one, one group that was like the last hit ever was uh, something like boys to men, right? And now it's a lot of long tail things that aggregate to see something that we call emergence. And we'll talk about emergence uh, as part of this as well. And then the final part of this that you must do in terms of data is Tuesdays. And my favorite story around this is a friend of mine had a six-year-old and they were holding hands and looking out the screen door. And the six-year-old turned to the dad and said, so dad, um, just what is it exactly that you're seeing out there that I'm not seeing that makes you know that it's Tuesday today. And so I think about people who have expertise in industries and you know they, they, they just know because they've seen so many times the same patterns. Their data recognition skills are good, their context is good. So we'll also talk about industry expertise. And then we wanna break down two myths today, one of which is that it's only about industry expertise because you can have a lot of anchoring biases you know, where you have to bring in diverse opinions. And the second is this notion of predictive analytics. Um, the myth is that, you know, it's, it's double digit growth last year, so we can predict it's gonna be double digit growth this next year. And uh, I know Daryl's gonna open up with a story that shows that that's just not true. You know, you need to use data in different ways. So that's my framing before we bring on the first one. I think the last thing is everyone talks about artificial intelligence when Future Proofing Next does studies. This is not our study, this is from Tech Essential. But um, when Future Proofing Next does our studies, the number one issue that people are, know is going to cause huge possibility change is artificial intelligence machine learning. So one of the things that we have to caution us against is there's no magic in it. If you're asking yesterday's questions and getting lots and lots of predictive analytics around bad questions or yesterday's questions, you'll just have a lot of big misunderstandings backed up with a lot of data, or of course, we also know about data bias. So this is something that we want to talk about. You know, you can have descriptive, predictive, and uh, descriptive, predictive, prescriptive in terms of AI. And we also think that we would add to this the ability to use data to model things with better questions. Okay, Sean, set up the creative and then we'll, oh, or yeah, do you want to set up the creative? I think we'll go back in time here, uh, I think. Um... And uh, the only caveat I'll make is I think there, this is a little bit of a artificial debate. I think we both appreciate both sides of the equation. And, and in some respects, if you ask people off the street, you know, what's Andrea like and what's Sean like, we may be arguing counter type to maybe our regular selves, but I don't think we're extreme on either bent. So, so that's my only recognition to the data team. Now it is truly gloves off. Um, what do we have? We have two or three minutes to make our opening argument here. Is that yeah, but I was going to launch, the, I was going to launch the first poll uh no i guess after the after the first arguments yeah never mind all right so i am uh, i am no longer you can put your pocket protectors away data people and uh allow the uh -huh. creative to shine through as it always does <laughs> in these debates um, i'm gonna uh, i have a expert team that are gonna tell you 15 reasons why i've counted down their arguments are all distinct and interesting uh, so i've got the humbling role of trying to uh maybe be the, uh, the, the entry point into what our arguments are. So first of all, you would think mathematicians, scientists, the best of all time would be huge data advocates. And yet, if I look at Einstein, if I look at Newton, if I look at even Stephen Hawking recently, you know, they would um, consider imagination and intuition as actually being much more higher forms of skill. I will quote Einstein, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the analytical mind is a faithful servant. So I have 300, 400 years of science on my side. I look at Amazon, one of the smartest companies, we would all agree one of the smartest companies in the world. They actually acknowledge the fact that 
when they get to a point about a point where they get 70% of the data they need, all of a sudden they let their intuition take over. They realize that there's a price to being hamstrung by data. And certainly, you know, we've seen their, their um, market results and initiatives they're obviously uh, doing successfully and they're doing it based on adding that human element of intuition on the end of every one of their experiments. If I look at the top 50 innovative companies that um, uh, Fast Company comes out every year, I would argue that more than 80% of those companies are primarily given uh, a lot more credence to intuition and creativity than they do data, even though there are probably bits and pieces of both and most. Uh, if I think about just the creative intuitive leaps, they make us human. You know, we're in a pandemic right now. And if anything, I've, I've recognized just the humanity around us and who's been resilient, who's risen up to challenges. You know, there's no graph, there's no extrapolation in the world that has actually was able to A, accurately predict this or B, straight line correlate to what you should do. It's been quite human in terms of how we both being able to react and respond and now actually try to climb out of this pandemic. Data can assist, but really, if you're looking for inspiration and action, you really do need intuition and creativity. Um, data is ubiquitous now. It's commodified almost by the fact that you've got tools to look at it and it's everywhere. And I think what makes us very distinctive uh, and have some own ability around it is the human factor of how do you take that data and turn it into something very inductive. And then finally, you know, data leads you down the trail of the faster horse. This is the whole Henry Ford syndrome and problem that if I had asked the customer what they wanted, they would have had a faster horse. Most data is either historical or present and really doesn't do a good job of mapping out where a potential future is. Um, you had mentioned predictive AI. I would argue a lot of forms of predictive AI are very circumspect at best of times and certainly don't add or don't address kind of gray swans. So my summary argument would be, um, Apple wasn't built in a spreadsheet. Disney wasn't created by a data scientist. You know, Nike wasn't built by an algorithm, nor do I think the future companies uh, of the world, brands, businesses, organizations, causes will be driven by data. I believe it will be primarily driven by great people using their human reasoning, but more importantly, um, their creativity and, uh, and intuition. That is my opening argument, Andrea. So let's move on to the first round and we'll have in the, in the first position, next slide. Daryl, oops, there it is. Uh, team data, Daryl Drennan and round one begins. Good morning team and thanks Andrea. I'm actually happy to be on team data. So Sean talked about mathematics. My undergraduate degree was in mathematics. And so today when people in my technology industry think of data div driven insights, they usually think about the kind of data that is gathered from artificial intelligence or machine learning, like we've already talked about. But data driven insights can be collected from focus study groups, surveys, polls, internet research. It's already said that it's ubiquitous. And so it could, it could be useful to help make decisions or chart a course when you can gain those data driven insights that you couldn't have gained or might not have been able to gain from your instincts or your gut or from your creativity. And so here's an example uh, that I'd like to share with you. Back in my telecom days in about 2004, I was general manager vice president for a competitive local exchange carrier in Houston. And so we, we competed against the incumbent carrier, SBC or Southwestern Bell, what is now AT&T. And so we sold local, long distance and internet access just like AT&T. And we were successful. We achieved our goals. We had a feel for the market and we could take that market share from AT&T by reducing the company's telecom spend by about 10 to 15%. And as many companies, we wanted to provide superior customer service. But I wanted to, I wa it wasn't enough for me. I wanted to accelerate our growth and gain even greater market share. And so I wanted us, my company, to be considered a market leader. And so the challenge was at the time, how do we acceler accelerate our growth 
against AT&T, who was the perceived leader in voice. You see, they were the establishment. They were the standard. A large company uh, or a company moving to Houston trusted AT&T and their brand. And so fortunately, I hired Andrea Cates <laughs> and her consulting team to help us accelerate our growth. And so I wanted deep double digit growth. I wanted more money, more money, more money. And so Andrea and her team came in and interviewed our team and conducted focus study groups with Houston area companies. And they interviewed a mix of companies, mix in size, mix in industries. And they gathered that data that we didn't have. And they gave us some insights that we didn't have from our gut or from our intuition or from our creativity. <laughs> and so you may wonder, what did we find out with the data? Well, while AT&T was the perceived leader in voice, there was no perceived leader in internet. And so this was discovered from the focus study group. So the key here is the qualitative insights from the customer conversations that they had uncovered the untapped market. And then we validated that with the quantitative data on the size of market, economics, product, pricing, to dig deeper into the business model. So we found out that if we were to redirect our marketing, our focus and efforts around being the internet provider, that we could establish ourselves and brand ourselves as the leader in that space. And we also found uh, an additional benefit. We found out that when we led with internet solutions, we were still able to pull through and sell a voice anyway. And so what was the result? Our sales went through the roof and we achieved double digit growth. And so if we hadn't had those data-driven insights, we would have continued selling the same way and leading with voice at a reduced cost. And that's my argument. Thank you very much, Daryl. And now we would love to hear from Team Creativity, Samantha Yarwood. No, Daryl, I think you raised some really interesting points there, but I would argue that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but that data is a piece of that story, because you mentioned a few times around AT&T and being a trusted brand, um, and I really think that you already had, I'm going to say, the permission or the trust um, and that emotional engagement piece to move forward. So the data helped prove where you should move forward. <laughs> so when I start to look at the innovation process or I start to think about, you know, what is needed, is it data or is it creativity? Um, I tend to lead more towards the creativity side. And, you know, Sean already mentioned this just around um, what makes us human. And I start to think about it from the perspective of what moves people to act or what is their motivation. And when you think about um, just the word in itself, motivation, um, it's that which moves or inhibits action. So the root of that really is to motor or to move, and that's all centered in the emotional piece. And when I think about innovation specifically, what I like to do is to think about, okay, what is the process or the methodology that would be most relevant? And I really think that needs to start with self or knowing who you are. And that to me, which brings it back to the creativity piece, is it isn't about there's one methodology to use. There's many methodologies that you can use or apply, but it's more about how you tap into your own creative process. And when I think about myself, I pull from lots of different methodologies. However, within that creative process, um, there's two common elements to me that are always the same. One is tapping into that power and that knowledge of the group, but also being able to use storytelling to move people to action. Definitely think data can be part of that process, but moving people to participate and adapt and adopt, I think can only be done when there's emotional capital or creativity and where that's used as a strategy. 
So I've just actually recently been doing interviews on uh, with several top leaders around how do they move their organizations to change and how do they actually implement complex and sophisticated change. And what is constantly coming up is that ability to build emotional capital. And that again ties back into the creativity element for me too, because it allows us to connect in an emotional manner. And with those case studies, what I've been able to notice is first, there has to be alignment between actions, thoughts, or feelings, because that's what's going to allow us to be sincere and considerate and drives that emotion or that creativity. There has to be that deserved pride. When people feel that they're involved, they can appreciate their differences, but most of all, their contributions, which again, moves them to act because they really believe in something. It also helps to create that realistic hope that today's actions will improve our future. And when you think about innovation, innovation a lot of times fails. We need people who want to get behind it and who actually believe in it. And they end up being really passionate about it. It comes from the heart, not for the mind. It builds that engagement. It gets them committed. And, you know, lastly, it also helps them to see that there is some sort of disconnect. We know that we haven't reached our full potential and we know that we want to continue to grow and achieve something. To me, it's not just about moving to that act based off of data, but it's including that positive emotional and creative piece to tie it back together because it helps to broaden the mind, but also it helps to build more emotional engagement. So I'm going to wrap it up there because I think I've got my three minutes. <laughs> Yay, Team Creative, sorry. Yay, go us! <laughs> <laughs> my, my bell was on mute. So, whoo! So those are both actually very moving. And considering we're discussing uh, business innovation, it should be moving. This is, this is what's super important. What we'll do first is have a poll, see how we're kind of take a pulse of the audience so far. And then we'll also have a chance to have a quick, uh, a, just a quick response, because really we want to do this in a few rounds pretty quickly. So we have time for more at the end. So let me launch the first poll. And you'll be surprised to know that it's uh, one or the other. So, so far, data-driven or creativity-driven? Which, which one is bringing better business innovation so far? And you can only vote once. <laughs> and we can't vote, Daryl. We can't vote. <laughs> I guess you can, but just cancel each other out, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, it's interesting. We've got creativity. Really? Okay. So, one, one round for creativity and... Don't let that affect your egos because we have two more rounds to go. Uh, so, so is there a, is there somebody who really wants to do like a really quick response? Dina, did you, did you want to jump in and say something quick before we do the next round? I did. I, I just wanted to oh, quick. Go ahead, oh, I'm Dina. sorry. Yeah. Bye, yeah, Dina, I sure. just, Samantha, I loved everything you said about storytelling and um, the need for bringing in matters of the heart and emotion. I'm a big fan of storytelling. And I'm a big fan of storytelling that does in fact lead to action. But my experience is that storytelling that just, just stirs emotion actually doesn't lead to action. I think it leads to other emotions coming about. And I think that the action, the action oriented um, aspect of storytelling really needs to be built around inputs and data. And I, and I think without the data, it, it's hard for people to relate to what action needs to be taken. And, and I just wanted to, to leave it at that because I think at the core of taking emotions to action is really building that around what is actually happening on the ground and reality through statistics and numbers and why that is, why it's important to hear a particular story. Yeah, okay, and I think more, you've got a, more, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Go I, ahead. Just, I think you've got a really valid point there. However, I think you touched on something really important, which is about input. And to me, to get emotion to act, there needs to be the story of yourself, the story of us, and then how we can take action together and be really clear on that. But I do think you don't remember the information. What you remember is how somebody made you feel. Absolutely. And if you can remember that that touched you and it tapped into something that you desire and on the input side that you were part of. So if you get to co-create something, I do believe and um, that that gets more motivation and action behind it. So I, I think there does have to be that one there. Absolutely. So I just do have to ding, ding the bell. Yeah, Daryl, do you want to say one last thing? <laughs> yeah, real, real quick, because I, I thought of John Maxwell is one of my favorite authors and he wrote the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And one of the laws is the law of navigation. And so if you have this leader that's leading you to the North Pole, but doesn't have the data for, to chart the course or know how much food supply or water supply you need, 
the people can follow him and they can, they can, um, you know, have emotion and they can be moved to follow him, but he needs that data to get him to the North pole. And so, uh, we agree with, with, um, you know, what is needed as a leader to move people and have them passionate, but you also need the data to make sure they can get there. So I will insert the fact, I just had this revelation. This is going to be the best debate of my whole season. I live in the United States and we're about to have some really gnarly ones coming up. So I'm, I'm glad we can start off with some, some good, fun, loving, uh, mutually supportive uh, people on teams, even though we're opposing each other. So I will, I think next we'll go to the schools and techniques. So Sean and I wanted to introduce a couple of things. There's lots and lots and lots of schools and techniques. And as everybody's figured out, you can't have data just automatically give you insight. You can't have gut instinct automatically give you business growth. But well, I'll, uh, I'll start with my list on the right, which is we'll talk about some of the schools and techniques because we just want to introduce them because some of them are new as well. So business analytics have been around a long time. Business uh, predictive modeling has been pretty popular, though it future proofing next, we have something we call suggestive uh, data. So data analytics where we're using suggestive models where you see early signs of things and you have to make some leaps. AI fueled we talked about and this notion of emergence science, which is looking cross industry, looking outside of our, our usual places to find, uh, to find answers. And we are actually running short on time. So Sean, do you have a quick description of these techniques in the, uh, in the yeah, I think this is our attempt to at least, uh, we didn't know how acidic our arguments uh, were going to make. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we're some information exchange. So I think we've, we've got the info going. So maybe we, did, we didn't need to yeah. the middle slides. So, but I yeah. do think there's different future schools, I think, anywhere from science fiction writing to some co-creation and open innovation stuff. Design thinking is kind of the, the poster boy or girl of uh, Silicon Valley and, and other corporate innovators where it's just deep, deep understanding of customers and the meaning and behavior of what they're doing. So these are a number of different examples that um, are common in terms of more of the creative side of things. Great. And that's the backdrop for the next slide, which is first up in round two is Anthea Foyer, cre Team Creativity. So I was just thinking about the stars and about how when you look at the beautiful stars, they're so gorgeous. But by the time like the light reaches us, they're already dead. And that's a little bit like data. Data is always in the past. It's and planning is always in the future, and so uh, and and future planning always requires imagination. Uh, data is an amazing tool to help support creative creativity and imagination in the world, um, but it really is sort of a support system because even when you're doing analysis of data, that still requires a creative mind and creative insight in able to to look at it in new ways and to plan for the future. I work in government um, uh, and across the world, governments have a lot of uh, mistrust from, from their populaces, whether their data is right or wrong. And public imagination often trumps that. And we can see that right now with a lot of um, movements like Black Lives Matter or um, the defunding the police movements that are going on. There's, there's facts there, but really it's the public imagination about a different world that's possible that's really forcing that change and creating a new possible future for a lot of people that might not have been heard which I think is also maybe um, also another part of, of data is that we also need to be able to, to plan data and decide what data is so that it doesn't have bias and it doesn't have um, systems set into it uh, prior to it, it moving forward. And I think it does require our imagination to really build these things like these AIs and these systems and these machine learning tools so that they do have um, room within them for growth in the way that we as humans would like to see them go. And so I really think that um, for me, one of the big tools that I use is foresight. And foresight is a big mixture of, of data. So you look at the data of what's happened, um, but it's really around using your imagination around what's possible and then creating those stories and those scenarios around it that are based on data, but to be able to move um, populations in ways that are uh, improve the public good. Great. I will ring the bell. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Sorry, my brain. <laughs> and now Tom and I Chase. I don't know, somebody's baby in the background was really supporting Anthony's yeah, argument. Yeah, super supportive, <laughs> super <laughs> supportive. I didn't know if it was a cat or a child, but that's the fun of the pandemic is that we're all naturally at home. So Tom, 
Yes, uh, thank you. Well, I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm very pleased that uh, someone started with the story about the stars. Um, there's a Gaia project, a European-funded uh, project uh, to look at the stars, and it's mapping the universe as we speak. Uh, it's mapping uh, the Milky Way, and it's not only giving us data about the positions and the proper motions of the stars at the moment, it's also giving us predictive data about where those stars will be in the years, even millennia to come, which is an absolutely fascinating project. I just want to start by saying that um, Sean mentioned it in his introduction, you will feel compelled to, to vote for intuition, for creativity, because it's the last gasp of humanity. We think that it's, it's the one area where we're outstanding, our intuition, it's what puts us above machines and it puts us above the pure hard data. We're wrong, our intuition is terrible. We've seen this time and time again. We have countless studies that show it. We misestimate probabilities. We, we create narratives which are false around the data in order to explain things because we don't understand them. The only way to get around it is to better understand the data and not approach it with imagination or with intuition or with bias and distorted judgments. <clears throat> when those distorted judgments start interfering with financial decisions, healthcare choices, uh, transportation choices, energy mixes, it's not innovation, it's gambling. Let me tell you why data-driven change is much, much better. Alpha Zero is a chess computer. It's taught itself to play chess in something like 24 hours. It was unrestrained by human uh, programming and by human intuition. It simply played hundreds of millions of chess games and it taught itself how to be the best engine in the world. It's showing us a better understanding of the game. But this is just a game, right? So let's talk about something more important. Lung scans. Google can scan lung uh, um, radiographies um, and it can detect tumors better than top cardiologists, uh, sorry, top uh, uh, doctors around the country. Um, it, it outperforms radiologists and being a specialist in the field for 50 years is no match for this machine. Medical tech researchers have also developed smart nappies that can detect the mineral content of baby's urine. This can detect indicators of infection before the baby starts showing any symptoms. This is something that is predictive, it's useful, it's innovative. Let's talk about transportation. Um, transportation computers can show us whether a pilot is flying dangerously, whether a, a, a driver of a car is driving unsafely. It can detect where we need bandwidth in, in telecommunications. It's tailored at the user's end, at the, the, the user's end of the data in order to, uh, to, to best use the, the the, the vast quantities of data that is being generated. This is true innovation. We've moved from big data, which is what most people still think we use, uh, to using smart data. It's inefficient to process huge quantities of data. Now we, we target it at the user end. It can reduce drug development times. It can improve uh, wealth generation on financial portfolios. The list goes on and on and on. And this is what real innovation is. It's not the narrative and the storytelling and the, um, the, the, the hopes we have for humanity in believing that we're one step ahead. Let me tell you, intuition is simply, is simply our ability to detect patterns. Humans can... Uh, Computers can already do that better than us, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in research, in whichever field you want to apply it to. Sean mentioned Einstein in his introduction. Uh, Einstein was famous for having this intuition where he could read an equation and he could see what that meant in the physical world. When a scientist tells you you've got excellent intuition, that means you can, he, he's telling you you can manipulate the maths and the equations because you have a, gr a very good grasp of the data. And, and I think fundamentally, this is what we're talking about. A better understanding of the narratives and of the emotions and of what goes behind it means a better understanding and a better use of the data. If I've got time, I'm gonna conclude with a very short anecdote on Ernst Rutherford. He, he, he discovered the, 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 um, the formation of the nucleus in the atom or the, he, it was his discovery. He did it on a hunch, an intuition. He turned the detector around and he realized that some particles were flying backwards at him. It was, hunt, it was a hunch, it was intuition. What that tells me is intuition can be very useful. But since then, we've had a hundred years of developments of quantum mechanics, lasers, CCDs, transistors, processors, everything. And, and why do we recollect this one moment? Because it has some narrative appeal to us. Our, our judgment is biased. It's tainted by narrative. And this is why we need to focus on the data because the data is the correct picture. And I conclude there. Perfect. <laughs> so let's do this in the interest of time. Let's have the vote now. I'll launch the second poll. Really great job to both. 
And this one is um, a poll that is um, about the different schools and techniques. Now, once again, you might not know what all of them are, but do your best. And what we'd love to know is based on what you've heard so far from the conversation, which technique floats your boat in terms of bringing business innovation results? First one is design thinking, AI-fueled decision-making, mind mapping, finding anomalies, open innovation, emergence science, brainstorming, predictive modeling. We'll give it 30 more seconds. Actually, we're good now, so I'm gonna end the poll. This is crazy. Oh wait, okay, <laughs> 10 more seconds. People are still voting. It's a long list. Okay, this is crazy. <laughs> so it's equal among design thinking, which is a C, uh, finding anomalies, which is a D, emergence science, which we created, thank you for voting for that, which is a D, brainstorming, which is a C, and predictive modeling, which is a D. So the Ds came out a little bit more than the Cs, even though we made up one of the phrases, which was pretty creative to call it emergence science. Um, so well, from the data modeling, you're on the data team as well. So I will just say that we cannot take these to the bank. We've, uh, we're doing this mainly for our recorded audience. So uh, we should probably po post a poll next to when we post this page, just to see where people are on going on some of this, Andrea. You know, just because you lost doesn't mean you have to have another nuance to this. But yes, I agree with you, Sean. Absolutely. So, nice. uh, at, yeah, absolutely. So let's do round three just so we can get all three rounds in and then we'll have time for chat. So the third round is we'll start with Dina and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the strongest arguments you can argue and feel free to, to give it your best. This is our last round and team data, Dina Sharif. Yay. I will give it my best. So I think I, I, I'm going to frame my arguments around a, um, a number of stories. The for, first story is quite personal. So I'm a cancer survivor. A couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with an extremely rare type of ovarian cancer. There was very little research, very little data that existed about this research. And digging more and more, uh, it became very difficult for me to even feel what my gut would be considering that I had really had nothing to go on. And after a number of months of going through this experience, I realized, realized that there was a whole field of medicine that really didn't have sufficient data about the overall health of women, simply because they were not collecting it. And to have an entire field of medicine be built around data that is built around the body of a man and how men respond let, leads to how much misdiagnosis of issues related to women. And I think this is, there's nothing more important to demonstrate the importance of data than what is happening in healthcare in particular. Um, and we see this today with the global pandemic. And I, I'm in Egypt right now, but I normally am, am based in Boston. And it was very difficult for me to make a decision about whether I should leave Boston and fly back to Egypt to be with my family simply because there was no real data about what was happening in Egypt with regards to COVID. It was very hard for me to make a decision about how much this would be a threat to my health or my family's health to travel. And poor po there was very poor policy in Egypt simply because they were unable to understand exactly how many people had COVID in Egypt, how many people, or how many, I, I really couldn't get a feel of how many people were getting tested. And all of that led to an, an inability to make good decisions. Um, and I think the, the next story I wanna tell is specifically a story about policy. So uh, I've also been an economic advisor to the president of Egypt and Egypt is a, is a developing country and over 40% of our population lives below the poverty line. That's not a small amount of people. But for years we were dealing with poverty in Egypt without really digging into the data and policies were not working. We were not seeing real shifts in numbers. It was for the first time um, between 2013 and 2015, we really went into a strong effort of collecting the qualitative and quantitative data about the lives of poor people in Egypt in a way that would allow us to design a program that completely reimagined what poverty alleviation in this country could look like. And 
to, to Anthea, to your point about reimagining systems, we would not have been able to reimagine that pol those policies without really having the data required to do that and to really rethink the system. And the last story I want to tell is a story about entrepreneurs. I've been advocating for impact driven entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship for years and entrepreneurship that is really geared towards problem solving. What I've found is that those who fail are the ones who really make assumptions and just go on intuition. And those that succeed are the ones who design their business models based on actual on the ground data and proper sensing and understanding the users and the needs of the users. And those are the business models that continue to thrive and solve problems. So I, I, I believe creativity is important, but creativity without data for me is just good art. Thank you, Dina. And last up is Rob, and you bring it all home. So let's uh, let's begin the last and the the last part of the last round. Sure. Thanks. And I am really delighted and humbled to be in the uh, participating in this conversation with uh, so many smart people that are raising so many great points about all of this uh, stuff, and especially on team data. I mean, I myself in my professional practice. Right now, I'm neck deep in a data analytics product project where I am using a lot of advanced uh, metrics to try and discern some, some truth and some strategies forward from a big body of noisy social media data. And in the course of doing this, I wouldn't, number one, I wouldn't dream of presenting that raw data to my client without some surrounding context, story, and narrative that makes it relevant to their business interests. Um, and in fact, as I'm in the process of doing it, as I'm looking at the data and the things that are coming back from it, I'm realizing based on my own experience and intuition that if the data set coming back is, looks a little bit skewed, chances are the problem is that I formed the queries wrong and that it's, that is my problem of asking the wrong questions. I wouldn't know that if I was just sort of making blind and naive uh, assumptions about the validity of data coming back from these systems. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that data systems that we've created are incredibly impressive feats of engineering. They're the product of you know, dozens of years and piles of investment and effort, but our brains are the product of millions of years of evolution and that we are finely tuned uh, by nature to draw inferences from very sketchy clues and very noisy data sets and to do it quickly and to be right more often than we're wrong. The people that are standing around deliberating whether or not that saber tooth tiger is hungry are no longer in the gene pool, right? So, so as impressive as our systems are, I think recency bias gives us false confidence in the validity of uh, the data that's coming out of them relative to our own skills as pattern recognizers and problem solvers. And uh, I'd also like to address a point that, that Dina made that I think was earlier in the, in the conversation that was really uh, on point. And she was talking about the unfortunate emotional power of stories uh, that lack a data component. And I think we see that writ large, unfortunately, in, for example, America's response to the COVID pandemic, that a lot of people in leadership are convinced by emotionally impactful narratively complete stories that are completely lacking in data and they're ignoring a huge body of data-based evidence that will lead us to better outcomes. To me, that's an argument for developing better storytelling practices within our organizations to make that data more convincing. Because at the end of the day, data needs stories more than stories need data. Powerful stories that exist without a data framework are convincing. They are resonant, and unless you are managing a team of Vulcans, you kind of need that convincingness of it, of the, the, the data to motivate and empower your people to get the results that you want. So I would urge organizations that are looking at this, of course use database tools, of course let data lead you to, uh, on the path to better outcomes, but also invest heavily in the creative, the intuitive, the storytelling and communicative skills that both managers and teams and leaders are all going to need to make that data effective, convincing, 
operable and winning in an argument uh, rather than just assuming that it's going to speak for itself because it's obviously so much more true. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's give a big round encore, of applause encore. to everybody. Encore. That was all, all three, all three rounds were great so far. Um, let's let's do the poll, and then we're going to have something we call round the horn. So let's just see how we've how we've how the poll turns out. We'll do poll number three, which is which team right now made the better argument, creative or data. And Andrea, even if we lose this one, we're fine with it because we're creative. We're not driven by data. So um, <laughs> all I can say is that's that's a really no, good we, that's a really good narrative to have, Sean. We we love that narrative because we'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and sharing the results. Oh, this is interesting. I could have stopped it actually when it was 50-50, but I waited just that little bit longer. Uh, okay, data came out a little bit ahead. Woo, team data, yes. Small sample <laughs> but, fallacy. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely small sample fallacy. Um, at the same time, we're going to do around the horn, um, which is, you know, for us to reflect on this. And, and there was a really great comment made that said, there's kind of this blend that felt like it was coming out, which is, uh, let's see, the question was, David, in the end, it seems data-driven intuition is the winner. And, and, you know, one could argue that we were making a false, you know, split and, and uh, to, 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 to try to create a debate, but, I, but it's not for me to say. So let's go backwards in order. Let's do uh, Rob, Dina, you know, we'll do around the horn. It has to be quick, really quick. Uh, we only have a few minutes, but one thing that you learned and one thing that you want to do as a takeaway. And, and once again, we knew we were going to run out of time before we run out of topics. So um, one thing that you learned from this and one thing you'd like to say as your you know, word of advice. So let's start with you, Rob. So I learned about the wide range of impressive things that are being done with data, uh, thanks to Tom and Dina and, and Daryl. Um, and the, the, the outcomes of that are, are really fantastic. Um, and I would, again, advise that it's precisely because the data is so good that we need to get better about the storytelling and making that data emotionally impactful and convincing. Great, okay, Dina, what did you learn and what, what would you like to have as your, your parting advice or insight? I mean, I think what I've learned is that data alone is not enough and creativity alone is not enough and we really need to see that mix. But I, I think for me, what I would say is that, you know, the, we really do need to have a strong base of sound data to be able to make good decisions about our future. And how we make decisions about our future is inevitably going to include a lot of our heart, hearts and, and emotions as much as the data that goes into our minds. And I, and I think that mixes everything. Mm, great. Tom? Um, I think my starting presumption that um, that uh, basically the data is is the driving force uh, has not really changed. I think every uh, manager in the world who's facing a complex problem uh, will first ask for the data in order to better understand the problem. But I do appreciate that the way we reflect that reality, um, the way we use it, the way we talk about it, and the narrative we use to get people on board is extremely important as well. And you could even say that it forms part of the data set itself. Um, so I think we all need to work on how that process of, of transmitting our results, our data results, and the, the reality we understand better uh, to the outside world. Great. And uh, Anthea? Um, I think that it's just this continual learning about how much of a messy space it is between the two, but how integral they are to each other, um, whether it's kind of like collecting communal data or um, looking at insights and working back from data that way. I think it's going to be a continual back and forth. And I think that that's the part that's interesting and that makes it the most human um, and the part that makes it the most valuable. So I think we just need to continue to ensure that we have these conversations and that they're, you know, at data tables, they're talking about imagination and at imagination tables, they're talking about data. Great. And by the way, next week, we're going to do it with the opposite. We'll have the three people switch roles and you could probably argue the other side. <laughs> no, kidding. Uh, so Samantha. 
insights. I actually like that idea because <laughs> when you think about it, I mean, most of the decisions that we make are actually unconscious, right? Like seven out of our 10 decisions are made actually before we even have the information in front of us. I do think data is important. And we've talked about this is like that tension that exists between the two. And I think that needs to exist because when you think about the complex world that we're in and in modern times, you have to have the two to be able to supplement the thinking. So re regardless if you're data driven or you're creative, you need the two to be able to you know, motivate people to move, but also to have that tension to make sure that, um, and that something's existed since like the beginning of time, right? But that's what we can do to bring it to life. And it's how about how do you tap into it and use both so we can actually blend. Um, and I think it was Rob who touched on this earlier, as well as Tom, is just making sure that we're thinking from both sides. That's great. And let's, uh, let's end with Daryl, and then we'll have just a, a quick, uh, a quick wrap up. So Daryl, yeah, so it confirmed what I already suspected, that it's not either or, it's both and. And, you know, Tom said it, you know, our judgment is biased, we need the data. Mm -hmm. And then Rob said, but once we have the data, we need our intuition to shape the narrative. And so I thought, you know, all speakers were spot on. Well, wait, is this the American thing where everybody gets a trophy? <laughs> just, just for being in the debate, is that is that what we're going to do? Everybody who plays, yay! Still well there, right? Everybody <laughs> plays, yeah, our government not so much. I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> well, first of all, I and Sean, are you ready with the final slides? Because we have a little bit to do at the end. Um, yeah, I, 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 really I thought I, I would let. You, you want to have yeah. a minute in terms of your own uh, recounting of. Uh, I thought I'd let you go first, Sean. Why don't you give a, a bit of a response to the to the team, and then I'll I'll close this out, and then we'll do our final yeah, slide. Yeah, I felt like in this role, I might still need to be the pit bull on, to, on the side of team creative. But you guys are so nice, and your arguments are so well rendered on the data side that I almost feel obligated to do the reach across the aisle and um, and compliment, you know, Daryl from a well. Of course, there's real live performance here, and you're you're complimenting Andrea here too, who worked with you. So um, I, I have a vested interest there. And Tom, you made some very evocative arguments as well. I, I'm like, God, those are some good bullets. I, I'd be, if this was a real debate, I'd have a tough one in terms of, uh, and Dina, you went for the heart. So as much as you went for the data, you went for the heart too. It's like, that's a killer combo. So I, I would say if I'm still wearing my creative hat though, it's like um, what I heard from Daryl was great use of data, but I think uh, Samantha made the point there was still a synthesizer behind that data that was able to actually, you know, create lemonade out of lemons, I suppose. So, um, and in Tom's case, I think my argument probably is a little bit less powerful 75 years from now, but machines are really good at doing stuff that takes humans five or 10 seconds to do. But like in terms of really high minded stuff, I'm still waiting for the argument that says, a machine can create another machine that can create another machine that can take us to uh, wherever. I, I think we've still got some of that. The seed behind all of the machine stuff is still human. And then from a Dina standpoint, I just think the, um, you know, you certainly got me with the heart stuff, but I think some of the poor practice of the data that's happening now is, is more probably an indictment of the person that's practicing it versus the actual kind of created creative kind of, um, kind of a person themselves. So, um, so that would be my, my counter argument, but great arguments all around. So, so I'll do my final yeah. thanks and Sean, I forget how many slides we have at the end, but you can pull them up as we're getting one slide. Great. So I, first of all, thank you. You guys were wonderful as provocateurs and raconteurs and raconteuses, teus? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and it was also really interesting because I kept thinking, I want more facts, I want more facts, give me some evidence, give me some evidence. And at the end of the day, it's the ability to be compelling even with the data that, that grabs me. And I wanted to end with my, the, my, what bubbled up for me was uh, I'm married to a person who's a pretty in, uh, well-trained scientist and he and I can stare at the same exact Petri dish. And he's looking at his and I'm looking at mine and I kind of see gel basically have no questions for the gel. I just keep looking at the Petri dish and he's looking at the Petri dish going, I wonder if the cells tomorrow that are currently just generic cells tomorrow, if they'll differentiate into nose cells and ear cells. And I'm like, where'd you come up with that? So <laughs> you can stare at the same data and still have people coming out with, hey, guess what? We've got 52% of our people who are customers that are women 
And you end up that that's your conclusion and that's not the best use of our minds. And so to me, it's about the question and the curiosity. And I came away with both of these. So yay, and it was really fun. It was, everyone was so spirited. So thank you so much for everyone to uh, partake part in this. We really learned a lot and uh, hope that we'll see you soon. And Sean, did you have a final slide for us? Uh, I think I did. Uh, just uh, one little prompt for people. I, I guess I'll make two. Uh, the sense-making abilities of the crew that we brought together, I just a small little plug for a guild that we have built. Uh, I know it was mentioned earlier, the Grace Swan Guild. Uh, we would obviously love to have all of our panelists and uh, people that are listening to it um, get to graceoneguild.org and see if you're interested. We, uh, it was born out of a pandemic, kind of minted on Zoom, and now is trying to impact real life. So, um, so that's my humble pitch there. Our next one is an interesting one. I've, I have a fascination with food, um, sometimes too much on weekends, um, but we're going to be covering off the future of agriculture and food on August 11th. So if you want to pre-register or learn what it's all about, um, you can go to futureproofingnext.com, Future Proofing Now 2020 schedule. And um, I want to thank Andrea for crafting this or co-crafting this. I want to thank all of our panelists who um, applied their trade so well in terms of supporting their different sides. And I want and to I'll do, And I'll do the, uh, the rollout. Um, so the final part of this is that we want to also today more than ever thank the panelists for sure. Uh, once again, I want to thank Sean Moffat who came on, you know, with gloves on and then was able to be uh, polite enough to take the gloves off. And uh, we do invite you to come to the next one, which is about future of agriculture and food. It's a huge uh, conversation, really important. And today of all days, before I close this out, I'd like to really thank the attendees because you served as our judges and your ability to be listening carefully and really listening to the arguments and the conversation made this a much more engaged type of experience than would have been with just a one-sided debate. So thank you so much to all of the people who are listening in the future and for people at the future proofing next world. We will see you in the future.